welcome to the XY Advisor podcast to join a global community of financial advisors sharing and learning with one another to drive the positive evolution of financial advice. Head to xyadvisor.com. This podcast is brought to you in partnership with Hub24. Hub24 make a difference in the lives of advisors by connecting you to innovative solutions that create opportunities with market-leading managed portfolios and customer service excellence. Want to know more? Visit hub24.com.au. Hey, how's it going? What do you know? Strike Light Clayton here and chatting with Matt over in WA. Thank you for joining me, mate. Absolute delight, Clayton. Yeah, this is uh, occasionally people give me the old run around and make me chase them for 12 months. And uh, in this case, it was definitely one of those experiences. We got chatting a year ago and you were entering into this new phase of your career and a, and a, a somewhat of a, an idea. And it's based off from, from our limited conversations, you're super interested in, in personal development. And that's kind of how you found your way into personal finance. And now you're focusing in on the cash flow advice. It's a super interesting story. Um, how did you get into, I guess, personal development, then finance, and then cash flow? What's that story? <laughs> Okay, in a nutshell. So I have been passionate about how to be the best version of myself ever since high school and those teenage years and the teenage angst prompted that that passion about how do I be the best version of myself. And then graduating, I discovered I'd ne- and I graduated as an engineer, petroleum engineer, and not as a financial planner. So and I discovered I'm earning money and I don't know how to use it. Nobody taught me how to use it. So that started part of the journey there. And I discovered when I was offshore. Um, on oil rig in the team or C, you know, there were, I met a bunch of miserable blokes who would tell me that they hated being there, wish they could quit, but couldn't afford to. So that even prompted me even further to learn about money, which actually led to me changing careers and going, well, actually, I don't like this engineering thing. Um, <laughs> personal finance is, is my game. But that realization that, hey, I was never taught about how to make good decisions with my money stuck with me right from the very start. And so I completed my grad dip in financial planning, my CFP studies, and we were advising people to do stuff. And I discovered most people struggle to actually do what we tell them to do. And I recognize that's a mirror to me is that there's lots of things in areas of my life which I struggle with. Um, and so that's what got me really passionate about the behavioral science side of things that I, that I weave in to the coaching. And so then looping it down to the money coaching from being a financial planner and a CFP for over 15 years is that, you know, it it makes me sad that there is less than 20% of the population that goes and engages, feels that they are able to and willing to engage a financial planner. And that stat hasn't changed in the 20 years that I've been in financial services. Mm. So I'm really passionate about helping the people who don't yet feel that able and willing to access a financial planner, hopefully grow those skills, be taught about money. And so it's, cash flow coaching is one of the things I offer, but it's really, it's everything that a financial planner doesn't yet offer um, mm. in, in that sense is part of the money coaching that I do. So I hopefully grow the profession so that more people get to afford to live a life that lights them up. Oh, I like that. Live a life that lights them up. That's good. Um, I fully recognize that, entire journey. I, I, I got super into personal development, maybe not directly out of high school. I was playing music for the first few years out of high school. But then when that collapsed underneath me, yeah, I, was, I didn't really know what I was doing. I was about 22 years old and I, I went to uni. And I ended up studying accounting. But during that whole period, I sort of got into personal development and money was a, a big part of that. And that sort of led into um, why I ended up doing um, financial planning and then as my role as a financial planner, I'll never forget someone saying to me once, Clayton, thank you for organizing all these things for my future self, which was investments, superannuation and insurance. And I'll never forget, they looked at me and said, but what can you do to help me today? And I was absolutely flabbergasted that I didn't have an answer to that question, seeing that I was a financial advisor. My job was to give advice around someone's finances. And um, 
it, and, and that led me down this whole path of uh, learning about cash flow and ended up becoming a key part of my service and ended up transforming my business. And um, I'll never forget at the time I was a part of a BNI. Do you, have you ever heard of BNI? Yes. Yeah. So uh, it works. Uh, it works really well for some people. For me, it didn't really work too well. Um, but I'll never forget the concept that I, I came up with was there was a mortgage broker in, in, in my BNI group. And I thought, how many people come to see you that want to get a mortgage, but you have to say no to them because their finances weren't in tip top shape. So literally as a business model to you, it makes sense if a portion of those people who don't become clients go through a cash flow coaching regime with me um, and then I can loop them back around to you and then they're in a better position to take out the loan in 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 the case of the finance, in, in the case of the mortgage broker. It is bizarre that such a small amount of people get financial advice and out of that portion of people who get financial advice, not everyone's getting cash flow advice. And yet it's almost the top of the funnel into financial advice. I think it, it just opens who is available to getting advice around money, even though, you know, technically you can't call it financial advice either legally, but ca- help with cash flow is a huge part of it. And so I fully resonate with uh, everything you've just said in your journey for, for how you've arrived at where you've arrived. What would you say to your younger self who was getting into financial advice about cash flow? I would suggest, actually, probably not much. Actually, no, hmm, that's a really good question. I would tell him to stick on the path of being curious about it because so many times in the last 20 years, I've perhaps doubted it when people in the financial profession have told me, oh, Matt, it's not commercial. Oh, Matt, you know, people don't want it. Uh, All these different resistances that people have thrown up to me. I guess I would say to my younger self, Matt, you are, listen to your gut. You are on the right track. It does absolutely start with that day-to-day. Yes, financial planning in the long-term future is critical and humans are terrible about thinking over the horizon. Yes. But they'll never get there if they can't. And they what their day-to-day money worry is about their day-to-day decisions, not about worrying about retirement. Yes, that sometimes it worries, but your day-to-day yes. is all these thousands of decisions I've got. So I would say to my younger self and any other planner out there, mate, if you've got this, mate being gender neutral, of course, Um, (laughs) if you've got this sense inside you that cash flow is important, listen to it because it absolutely is to the everyday person. And it is to me as an individual taking off my financial planner hat. That's what I, what I have to struggle with every single day. Is this affordable or not that I want, that I want to spend my money on? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, There, if you go back potentially almost at this stage, a decade, Um, Steve Crawford down in Victoria, he kind of was the first person to put his hand up. I'm not sure if you've come across his work, um, but he's, he sort of put his hand up and said, actually, this is an important part of, um, of financial advice. Um, I strangely enough, sort of uh, in my own independent way, came up with a a way for myself to handle it off the back of that question of my, uh, of my client. What's been your journey? Like, have you learned from other financial planners or how did, how did you come up with your coaching structure, your framework? Like, it, it, does it lean on anything or, or is it something that you've come up with yourself? Walk us through what it is. Mm. Yes, and it is definitely a mix of my entire life experience. But to be honest, the very first client is myself. So yes. this, this, the, the nexus for me is is right back to earning my first dollars as a graduate engineer and not knowing how to make the best use of it It, it, and not knowing if that opportunity that someone was inviting me out to a festival, a concert, a trip away, how do I know if that's affordable or not? Mm. So the nexus actually starts there and grabbing books at that point in time by Noel Whitaker and Paul Clitheroe, because yes, I am that old, Um, (laughs) (laughs) right? They were my first books that I read, like The Golden Rules of Wealth by Noel Whitaker was probably the first finance book along with um, The Richest Man in Babylon. And, you know, The Richest Man in Babylon is my earliest trace to the save 10% recommendation that's the earliest i've been able to chase it back to in that book but but then i found save 10 percent 
yeah, but is 10% enough? And what do I do with the other 90%? So <laughs> that's where it started from. And so I was reading books like Paul Clitheroe from then on then and then trying on myself um, and, you know, recognising that our great-grandparents used compartmentalised accounts with envelopes, jam jars and biscuit tins um, and trying that compartmentalised approach with myself, which Scott Paper is now popularised and calling it bucketing. Yes. Um, but it's been around for generations, totally. the whole compartmentalisation approach. And then really trying it on. And I know that other planners have come with their, their own approach, but really it has been trying to work out what works for me mm. um, from a day-to-day -day money management. But then there was another really interesting thing I found, which where my financial planning comes in, is observing what blew people's budgets and looking at many of the budgeting spreadsheets and budget planning tools that people are sent through, even the Money Smart website. I find that they're it's well-intentioned, but incomplete, those budgeting spreadsheets, um, because they don't prompt people to look over the horizon. And what are we really good as a finer planners? Prompting people to look over the horizon at their longer yeah. term goals and the fact that, hey, that car will need to be replaced one day. Most yeah. budgeting spreadsheets don't have that on them. Yeah. So for me, it was kind of that journey was looking at, well, what's the tools that people are given and that I was trying myself and realizing they're incomplete, they're not working. Mm. And then blending financial planning, well, which is the part that we're good at, which is over the horizon, but not the day to day, melding them together and coming up with what I would call a plan of what's affordable. And then looking at the behavioral science and saying, well, how do I stick to that plan? Because in the heat of the moment, who whips out their spreadsheet? <laughs> <laughs> no one does. So yeah. then, then it's like, well, how do I manage my habits and my yeah. in the heat of the moment to, to not give in to say impulse spending um, or not give in to my fear of FOMO, for example. Mm. So that's where the behavioral science came in, which I've found that some of the other cash flow work that I've observed wasn't necessarily incorporating as much. And a lot of that's super new, right? The behavioral, the habit stuff is super new. It's like five to 10 years. And I've yeah. been in the profession for 20 years. So I'm, you know, my personal growth um, passion that we talked about earlier, it's like, oh, that's what I read. I read nonfiction. I rarely read a fiction book. And I'm often reading about how to be a better human and be, and be the best version of myself. So it's often habit stuff. So that's how all the different parts have weaved together to, to the cash flow coaching that I offer now. And I will be the first to say, this is dynamic. Uh, there is more research always coming out. I, and I intend to always uh, is to stay on top of it and keep evolving what I'm offering as a, as a coach in line with what the latest research is saying and what my, my client's experience and my personal experience of managing my money is. Hmm. That's super interesting. What can you share in terms of the behavioral science stuff? Because that's a really, you know, it's quite comical. You say in the heat of the moment, no one pulls out their spreadsheet. How true is that? What, what's some of the best stuff that you've learned from the behavioral science element? Mm. Before I answer that, I want to draw a quick distinction because behavioral finance is talked a lot, a bit of a buzz in, in our certainly in the recent years I've noticed, and there's a lot of talk there about loss aversion and cognitive dissonance. And I'm talking about a particular subset that's more how we make decisions in that right. sense. So the day-to-day -day decisions. So one of the most recent books that I highly recommend, and I know it's been mentioned actually on some of the XY stuff that I've watched, James Clear's Atomic Habits that came out two years ago, sold a couple of million copies. James Clear has done a terrific job of pulling together a lot of the behavioral science research that's come out in recent years, particularly by an, a behavioral scientist, BJ Fogg, who wrote a book, Tiny Habits. So that right. pulls it together. So as a reference point for all the listeners out there, really highly recommend um, checking out Atomic Habits. Now, one of the really interesting things is in the behavioral sciences is, is looking at how do we make decisions? How does a behavior occur? And how does a behavior become a habit? And James Clear talks about in his book, which builds on Charles Duhigg's habits work earlier. Um, and he talks about the habit loop as being cue, craving, response, and reward. So a cue is, the cue is the prompt or the trigger that starts something off. If there's no cue, prompt or trigger, the behavior won't occur. Now, if that cue is something that we're familiar with, our brains will have a craving, a dopamine hit will kick off and we'll start to crave a particular result that that cue reminds us of. In, in the habit loop, response is the actual behavior you perform. Mm -hmm. And then if the behavior correct, creates a reward, and so that's another do dopamine trigger in the brain and, and other chemicals as well that reinforces that that was a good thing to do as a behavior and reminds us that that cue will create that, that pleasurable response 
And then, so the next time we see the cue, we might do it again. So, and a behavior repeated becomes a habit in that sense, both, both healthy and unhealthy habits. So for me, that is a, a great succinct summary for me of some of the great stuff that I've read in behavioral science of how a behavior performs. So if we think about applying that to our daily money decisions, yeah, and you're going to get me off. Get me off. I'm off yeah, you, you, if you want to get Please. off my soapbox, here I go. So I think. Go. Of, um, so when we think of a cue, a prompt, now a prompt or a trigger, in 2007, a marketing agency called I think Yalkovich said that at that estimated at that point in time, we are exposed to over 15,000 marketing messages a day. Now that was before social media advertising had taken mm-hmm. off. So now it's estimated wow. to be double that at least. So that's just the external cues that we get to spend money. Um, then there's the internal cues of feeling sad or lonely or bored or depressed or something like that. And marketers are absolutely adept at needling our weak spots to make us crave something. And it's and it's it's not just the the bright shiny object thing. It's the fact that we we crave respect, admiration, we crave belonging. So there's it's all tempting. So there's abundant cues. They're extremely tempting, and money is really easy. If you think, and most people who have not been taught about money have got all their money sloshing around in a single bank account, that's their only reference point for if something's affordable or not. It's a terrible reference point, wow. but it's their only reference point. So it's super easy to spend that money if it's all sloshing around an account. And worse, we've had credit cards and personal loans for years. Um, and now we've got buy now, pay later. So it's super easy to perform the response of just spending on a whim. Yes. Unplanned. And what's pleasurable, we all know if we get a buzz when we have something new or we get the oohs and the ahs about that. Oh, look, check out that awesome microphone I can see on the Zoom here. Oh, <laughs> tell me what that is, Clay. Oh, I love that. Go And, and so you probably just got a dopamine hit here and there. Oh, yes. Oh, yeah, right? So And that's it. So whoo, bang, the loop goes around. So from a behavioral science perspective, I have found that, and that's a recent you know summary come together. I found that a really beautiful summary that I lean on quite a bit in informing it. Now, how do we apply? Yeah, do you, want, do you want me to stop here because I could go on forever, mate? This is great. I'm learning heaps. <laughs> yeah. So, um, in so BJ Fogg talks about yeah you know, the Stanford professor. He talks in and his book was Tiny Habits, just to draw the distinction. Yeah, he talked about in a recent e- email newsletter how do all habits form? They start tiny. They find a really neat place in our routine, and they are reinforced by our emotions. Um, so that that's the science there. So. Um, both BJ Fogg and James Clear talk about, well, if you want to form a good habit or break an old habit is redesign your environment. So that sort of applies on the, if you think of cue, craving, response and reward as being on a quadrant graph, cue and response are on one axis and they're environmental things. So I look at, well, how do we redesign our environment in order to reinforce the positive behavior and stop, break the old habits of overspending. And then craving and re- reward are often emotional things. So we need to harness our emotions. So there, that's kind of words I used, which are very similar to the words that, that both BJ Fogg and James Clear use. So if we want to look at the behavioral science and how do we help people make better daily decisions with their money when they are, in, I say it's like a, a buffet. I have never, Clay, been to a buffet and not overeaten. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> right. Never been to a buffet and not overeaten because yeah. you know, there's lots of food. I know I love it. And it's yeah. super easy to pile all that food onto my plate and into my mouth. And yeah. then I've got elastic pants on or under. <laughs> right. Yeah. Now, I think that we are every day immersed in a spending buffet. There is abundant <sighs> temptation mm. and easy credit. And so it's and our prehistoric brains are not wired. For, for good decision making. Our prehistoric brains are wired to indulge in the feast in front of us rather than to think over the horizon. So we are navigating an environment, a modern environment of abundant temptation and easy money with a prehistoric brain. So that's where the behavioral science is really, really important to think about, well, how do we redesign our environment to make it easy to do the, the good things and how do we harness our emotions to reinforce those behaviors? So that's the science underneath that's super um, interesting. How I've developed the cash flow coaching that I do. That's super interesting, uh, especially the concept of every day is a spending buffet. Oh my God, that's so true. I am so susceptible to advertising that I haven't watched TV in a decade. <laughs> like I, I'm. It, it takes so much of my mental capacity, and let's face it, that's not huge. And I don't want to fill that up with advertising, right? So I like when you mentioned that there's 1,500 
marketing messages a day. I, uh, I don't read the newspaper. I don't watch TV, which frustrates the hell out of my friends because I never know what's happening in the world. But, uh, and then any, like if, if I go on the internet on both my phone and my PC, I have an ad blocker. I just like, I, I do whatever I can to avoid ads because yeah, it's, it does. It wanes on me. Like it, even, even if it's only, even if it only takes like 5% of my daily ability to ignore advertising, I just don't want to even spend that 5%. And, and because I know that I'm going to create an environment for myself to spend money on stuff that doesn't interest me. Mm, and so, absolutely. and so I, when you were talking about like developing behaviors, like I've basically built my world to protect myself from advertising purely because I know I'm susceptible to it. And, and, and the, I think calling it the world is a daily spending buffet is probably the best articulation of that concept that I could imagine. Um, Thank you. Yeah. It, it, it's, very, it's, mm. it's, a, it's well done. And- I'll jump in and reinforce something there for you for, for everyone listening. So I mentioned that you know, James Clear and BJ Fogg talk about designing your environment is one of the fundamental principles in developing good habits. So what you've done is redesigned your environment. Mm. And in Q, prompt or trigger, whatever word you use, BJ Fogg calls it a prompt, um, is the first step in any behavior starting. So by redesigning your environment to remove cues, you don't have to worry about the craving, the response or the reward. So that is the the fundamental step. So we can't remove all of them. And that's the pragmatic part of it here. But as much as you can do the things that Clay just talked about. (laughs) Yeah, that's that's super interesting. I I was probably just, um, yeah, I'm not smart enough to uh, have come up with the theory behind it. But I, I was like, I guess I got to a certain point where I was just, felt so exhausted and I thought how can I reduce exhaustion at the end of a day and yep. over time just removing advertising ended up being it, it you know even if it's just a little bit it, it, it really does help so for everything you've just spoken about it is very clear on why you've decided to specialize in this field it obviously interests you from an academic point of view a personal point of view it obviously uh, leans into the decades of experience you have in the personal finance field was what was going on in the industry from a regulatory point of view, from a cost point of view, from, from an upheaval top-down point of view. Did that play a role in your decision to take a sidestep into the world of unlicensed non-financial advice, financial coaching? Absolutely. Yeah. With some context, it's not the first time I've had a crack at this. Uh, uh, okay, okay, fair so enough. Super ambitious, uh, take on the world 20-something, changed careers from engineering, got into this and went, what? Why, why wasn't I told this when I was an engineer? Super passionate, evangelizing, had a crack at it before I knew what the hell <laughs> I was doing <laughs> and, and never had any business mentors or exposure <laughs> in my life. So that was a learning opportunity. I think I referred to it before in our pre-chat as a rapid growth opportunity. Yes. Then I went back into an employed role. Um, but in the tw- no, the pace of rapid evolution in the 20 years that I've been in financial services from 2000 when it was the Corpse Act first came in, yeah. the, the big Corpse Act changes, the pace has not changed, mate. It has been getting progressively harder. Um, and yeah, one of the things that broke my heart is I could no longer, I felt that in the environment I was in, I could no longer deliver the customer experience that I wanted to be able to do. With, and the, one of the reasons for that was all the regulatory time. Yeah. The complying with regulations was meaning I couldn't deliver advice in the time frame that I wanted to in the manner I wanted to to meet their expectation. Yeah. So I didn't want to toss the baby out with the bathwater because I'm still so super passionate about the education as I, as I hope is coming across. Yes. I thought, well, I'm going to give this money coaching a crack um, and see if I can make a difference with that knowledge and that passion there still. Um, yep. in that sense. I love financial planning still. I, I, yeah. I would still be a, a licensed advisor. If uh, it made sense. And do this if I could find a, a, a way to make it make sense yep. and, and allow me to be the best version of me. Yeah. No, this is, this is what I, whenever I get the opportunity to speak to someone that's influential within the industry, 
I give them a very basic scenario. And you're a perfect example of that scenario. And it's you're not the only one I know. I know, I know and it's and it's a growing, what I tell them, a parallel profession. This is a natural market response to the level of changes and oversight that they want to push on the industry. And 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 so when I get to this junction, I or juncture, I should say, I, I always like to say. Do I, along with 99% of advisors, agree that advice needs to improve and we need to get to a better a better outcome for clients more reliably across the board? Without a doubt. Uh, absolutely. Are there changes that need to occur in order to achieve that? 100% yes. Um, the problem is, is every single political party, every single one of them, sees financial services as a plaything to muck around with. I, I was just reading today about the shadow treasurer who presented at the AFA conference being very clear that he wanted to remove insurance commissions. Now, what does that mean? It means that when FOFA came in, that was a real watershed moment. And one that I personally, I thought they, I thought they got it right because what they said was anything from today, 1st of July, 2013, Any super product or investment product that's issued at this stage moving forward will not have a commission attached to it. However, for the hundreds of thousands, actually millions of people that are all connected in some way via these contracts that existed, uh, we're not going to cancel them because, well, that would destroy the livelihood of probably, you know, a few thousand uh, people. Um, who who have all gone into debt and who have all made life decisions based on these environments. And and yet it had a clear path and a clear road to an environment 30 years from now at an accelerating rate, entering into a world where there was less and less of that product, commission paying product in the industry and thereby creating a transition from pre-FOFA to post-FOFA world without creating 30 years of change in 30 months. Because when you when you push rapid change onto large swathes of people, you end up in a horrible, horrible mess. And the suicides are there to make that point. And I say that very much unfortunately. In yeah, fact, absolutely. I just got off the phone to... Uh, to someone, and we were talking exactly about this. He was he was mates actually with uh, an advisor that has passed away by suicide over the last twelve months, and yeah. uh, and so it's this is it is it's beyond heartbreaking. And uh, and the reality is, if the industry pushes for more change in this short amount of time, because <laughs> we still haven't caught up to the reversal of that FOFA outcome and face here, and now. <laughs> The next political guy on the scene wants to make a, a name for himself as the as the shadow treasurer and says, "Oh, you know, we're just going to pull this out as well." Mm. And I go, I go, okay. Again, like a lot of people, we all perceive, we all want this ideal environment where you know commissions and conflicts and everything don't exist in a world where the word advice is used. I get it. I understand. But if you enforce another 30 years of transition change in in another 30 months, that suicide rate is going to skyrocket. So my only conversation, if I ever get the chance, would be to have to people like this is, we can do what you want. It just, what's your body count? Like, what are you comfortable with? You know, would you want 100 or 50 or like, 20 like what, at what like or 500 what do you want because that's where we are right now we're, we're, we can do whatever you want to do you're in charge but at the end of the day the body count's going to follow how severe you enact this and so I the, the, the change in the industry annoys me not because of what is trying to be achieved but in the timeline that advisors are given to make the changes and the sense that someone can make a name or a career out of push or forcing changes through in a rapid amount of time. So when you say that these changes that were pushed onto the industry forced your hand 
to do what you want to do and to provide advice or not advice, to provide coaching in, in what's legally allowed outside of that licensed environment, then it, it makes perfect sense to me. And I see a growing number of people doing it. And the facts are, there's, fast forward five years, if they push through everything they want, there's going to be more of you than they are financial planners. Mm. And but look, potentially. Um, and so there's a, definitely a pragmatic element to, to my decision decision there. And I think there's also the reality that we probably need more money coaches there. And totally. the other that we haven't, haven't put there is it, that might be useful for the listeners is I only have the minimum amount of study to do. I, it's not that I have to do a whole master's or a grad dip or anything like that that's driving this. No, I have to do the FASI exam and the ethics. That's it. Because thank God to my 20 year, my 20 something year old self who decided to do a post-grad diploma <laughs> instead of an undergrad diploma like everyone was mm. telling me to in 2000. I only have the minimum stuff to do here. So it's not driven by a fear of education standards that I'm making this decision. Absolutely not. Yeah. Um, so, but I do really think that it would be great if doing this kind of education was easier. Like one of the frustrations, actually, I don't know if I'm going off a bit of a tangent now as well, Clayton, but um, one of the frustrations is that I can't get, when you're a money coach and you're not licensed, technically speaking, you can't do one-on-one investment education or talk about superannuation. But there's plenty of people like, you know, prominent celebrities who have got one-to-many online courses teaching education and get rich quick. So totally. you can do one-to-many investment education, but you can't do one-on-one stuff. So That's one-on-one, crazy. you're pretty much limited to it. So I guess in a sense, we've ended up where we are from pragmatic reasons um, and still the legislation is is there. So I, I, I would love to see how we could work licensed advisors and the ones like me who are choosing not to currently be licensed can work together to actually grow the profession in the environment we pragmatically find ourselves in. We yes. can't change the environment. We just have to make the, well, we can try to influence the environment, but we've yes. got to make some day-to-day pragmatic decisions about how we navigate that environment together. And that's why I love the idea of licensed advisors who are overwhelmed collaborating with the money coaches out there yeah. to say, how do we work together and grow the profession? Um, you know, you don't, yes, right, like you said at the start, Clayton, about, yes, cash flow is the foundation for all financial planning, yeah. but advisors are overwhelmed. Um, yes. Adding yet another speciality, hard to, but but what about all those people that, and I've experienced this in my career, the, the people who would call up um, who had taken the courage, takes huge courage to put your hand up and say, I want help, call up a financial planner, but they haven't got enough savings to afford the advice fee. Yeah. Um, you know, or actually after you're having a bit of your chat over the phone for 15 to 30 minutes, you realize, oh, actually it's debt. That's what they want. They want to get out of debt. They're overwhelmed by debt. And again, that's real. Well, really just save more and make extra payments. So perhaps don't come and see me yet. Yeah. I was frustrated by then. Where do I send them? Yes. There was nowhere else to send them. And and as I said before, sending them to a budgeting spreadsheet is, you know, an incomplete, incomplete tool. But what they need is like a personal trainer for their financial fitness is the yeah. anal- analogy that I use for myself. So I wonder which uh, as a profession, we have got a, a missed opportunity happening right now that Absolutely. it just I just certainly found that every single time I could say to someone, look, I can't help you, but I know you need help. So how about I introduce you to someone who can help you? Yeah. That, the person on the end of the phone got a much better experience and I look much better as a professional and it's yeah. much better for us as a professional. And that's what great professionals do. If we can't help, we point people in the right direction. So totally. I would love to see as a, and like we do that with estate planning. We do that with, if we're not more licensed credit providers, we do it with mortgage brokers, accountants. So let's do it with the money coaches out there um, and have collaborations there because uh, we're not competitive. We're collaborators. So I sort of see financial planners that I work with as, okay, if, if you've got a lead who's not yet advice ready, they want help. So if we don't give them the support right in that moment at that courageous moment, they'll probably lose momentum and flounder and maybe stick being one of the, the half of the Australians who live pay to pay. How about we help them on that journey by collaborating together? I'll help them get their their day-to-day money skills going so that their saving rate is there and so that their debt repayment is there. And then I can pass them back to you so that your practice is growing um, and the community is growing in its financial well-being because financial well-being is one of the major contributors to mental ill health. 
or low yeah. financial well-being is a which is a real passion for me actually the impact on day-to-day stress and and well-being yeah, of massive. finances is a passion passion for me so i would love to see this is all the, the altruistic idealistic matt you're hearing now <laughs> i'd love to see us all collaborating the money coaches and the licensed advisors to say how can we improve the financial well-being of all australians which will have an impact on their overall well-being but it'll, a part of which is the the day-to-day decision-making that a money coach might do, the illuminating their understanding of the importance of thinking over the horizon about superannuation and long-term wealth creation. And then the licensed planners coming in and going, okay, now here's how we're going to help you navigate all yep. the strategies and the products that that will take to put yes. that into place. Well, so, yeah, no, um, it, it's it's even more important than just simply altruism. I think, it's, I think there's a, a business growth model there as well, because if your practice doesn't do cash flow and you let uh, someone that's making 150K out, who walks out the door, who just hasn't spent the time to save any money so they're, and they're not interested in buying a house and, they, and they've only worked for a couple of years so there's not much in super, well, then you've just lost a super valuable client. And so, um, and so there's a lot of people with business models who have adapted cash flow into their business so that they're actually able to convert those um, high, oh, I think they're called Henry's, high earnings, not rich yet. Henry, high earning, not rich yet. So these Henry's, right, who are coming into uh, client into financial planning practices, if your business model can uh, pull them into your, cl- into your client base, then you're, then you're set up to be able to, to make the most of that situation. But if you're like the majority of advisors who have yet to adopt financial, uh, sorry, I should say cash flow uh, practices into your um, service offering, then it makes absolute sense to work. So I think what you're saying is you actually work with financial planners, right? So what they should be doing is if they don't currently do cash flow, they should send them to someone like you because then you're, you're going to, in your little CRM, it goes, okay, this client came from Clayton Daniel in, in, the, in the case that I sent. And then, so you're talking to me, I assume you keep me up to date with how that client's doing, maybe on a six monthly or annual basis and be like, actually, you know, we are probably 18 months away from a reintroduction back to you, Clayton, for financial planning. Is that kind of what you that is do? absolutely the potential I see for financial planners. Yep. So one part of the potential I see for financial planners collaborating with money coaches for those client for those leads, let's call them or prospects, they're human beings. So yep. they're, 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 you know, the clients or prospects that aren't yet advice ready. But there's the other element, Clayton, and this is comes from the fact that as a financial advisor, I was always a, a goal-based financial planner. And I imagine that for those who are in some way goal informed or even got true goals based that Fraser Jack would call it. Um, <laughs> most of the time that people came in, in order to achieve their goals, the, the extra investment or con- superannuation contribution that was required usually required them, it was more than what their current saving capacity was. So I think as planners, many of the time, perhaps we would be saying to people, okay, here's the money that you need to invest in order to achieve those goals you've articulated that will require you to reduce your spending. Yep. And that's where me, us as a profession have, many of us have stopped. We leave it up to the responsibility of the client yes. to find some way to do that. Yeah. And what I have realized in my own lived experience of trying to manage my own money is if you're immersed in a spending buffet, that's bloody tough. Yeah. That's, and it's almost, and, and I wonder whether the consumer expectation is, like you, your experience of BNI that you described earlier, perhaps the consumer expectation is, well, you're telling me to cut my $5,000. How? Mm-hmm. Uh, and so I think even for those people, those clients of ours who are engaged as clients but need to reduce their spending in order to achieve their over-the-horizon goals, there's the opportunity there to collaborate with a money coach at that point in time. Um, you know, if you don't want to have a cash flow ser- service in your in your practice, and to be honest, trying to start a new service in your practice right now when you're already overwhelmed with changes, it is, is hard. very difficult. Yeah, so the click I, off the blocks thing is to f- collaborate with a money coach. Yeah, it took me later, about boom. three years. It took me about yeah. three years, I reckon, to get up and running. It's doable, but uh, yeah, look, and and I think more advisors should be doing it. But I think using someone like you uh, makes sense just from a. a an, an ability to rapidly um, increase what it is that you're, what it is that someone is going to get 
by calling you. Uh, in, in XY, right? So in XY, like our clients are the large financial institutions, right? And so I go into a meeting and we do a handful of things. Um, and if they're asking for something, so they might say, you know, we, we want to achieve X, Y, Z. Uh, if we don't do that, I, I'll just say, actually, you know, the trade media or the associations, they probably would do this for you uh, in a much more efficient and effective way than what we can. Um, and so for, for me, I walk into, uh, you know, even a sales meeting with a very consultative frame of mind. It is, how do I help you solve your problem Hopefully it's me. Hopefully your problem lines up with what I sell because I want to make money from your solution. If I can't, if I, if for whatever reason, my solution doesn't align with your problem, then I still want to help you solve your problem. It's just, it's going to be over here, not with me. And so um, I think, I think having a mortgage broker, having an estate planner, having a wealth coach, um, or cash flow coach, I should say, all of these people make so much sense to have on the on the board of of referrals. Um, that I mean, it, it makes a lot of sense to me. And I think probably because I did the three work three years hard work to properly introduce financial uh, uh, sorry cash flow into my um, into my business. I'm sure probably you could do it quicker than that, but it did take me sort of a long time to get my head around. Um, properly, like how to fully integrate it. Um, and so if someone's not willing to do that and they want to be able to help quicker, also lead to, you know, the long-term um, lead, if you want to call it that, to circle back around, which ultimately, like I feel is a very valid reason. You know, like I used to work with the mortgage broker um, and but it always surprised me that they didn't do it more often, right? I was like, with five people, if you turn five people away this week, technically, you know, 18 months from now, two years from now, they would, those five people would say, you know, you'd be able to help them. So um, yeah, it's, it doesn't make sense to let those people, those Henry's, especially high earning, not rich yet uh, people fall flat on the ground. I think, I think we should definitely be doing something about it. Yeah, I agree. I think there's a huge potential, but I understand with all the change in the profession, why it's been very difficult for people to get their head around it, totally. which is why perhaps there's a now huge opportunity with people like me yeah. choosing to be money coaches. Um, let's collaborate with them. I think there's that step before having your own cash flow coaching service, yeah. um, which perhaps stop people, people doing it, but it just can start with a referral. It totally. just starts as, as, a, as a, a loose referral thing. Yes. Um in that sense, the and people get the help that they need. Um, yeah. In that sense, and and I, you know, to be honest, and if I may raise a little bit of a controversial topic, I don't know how much time Please. we've got left, but I, towards the end, uh, before I left being a licensed advisor a year ago, you know, I was seeing much more pressure that when clients needed pressure from the licensees, that when clients, when you did need to tell a client to cut their spending, um, that therefore you had to scope in cash flow and budgeting. Mm. Right. So the licensee is, is I, I'm hearing from other advisors that their licensees are now saying you can't scope out cash flow and budgeting. You have to scope it in. Does the way <laughs> that many advisors are meeting that definition, yeah, is it compliant, your delivery of cash flow and budgeting, but is it meeting the consumer expectation? So back to my my previous example, that if someone told me they were helping with the cash flow and budgeting, but then just gave me a spreadsheet and didn't help me how, yeah. does that meet my customer expectations? So there's a part of me provocatively, Clayton, that sits here and wonders whether scoping in cash flow and budgeting advice could be the next fee for no service. Oh, um, there you by, go. Yeah, I hadn't thought of that one. By not actually meeting the consumer expectation, by being compliant, yeah. but not meeting their expectations. So a few years down the track, when your, your retiree client is running out of money because they keep calling you up because unforeseen expenses are calling them to, to draw money out of their pension and you scoped in cash flow and budgeting, who's the finger going to be pointed at mm. from a consumer perspective, right? Yeah, totally. And when the consumer's upset, the, the politicians are trying to make a name for themselves, start pointing the finger at us. Totally. I, I, and <laughs> and I, I think that I think a part of phase here is if you don't have the specialities, you, you, you should look to refer. And I think that's part of, I think it's yeah. almost written into code now. So, um, oh mate, look, I hope that your, um, that your second stab at this service 
is successful. Um, all the best to you. Congrats on the first 12 months. I mean, everyone knows the first 12 months out of the gate, it's always the hardest. So thank you so much for um, actually, you know, coming and doing this interview. I, I really appreciate hearing from you, mate. And um, yeah, it sounds like you, you, you know a lot about the subject. So I really, um, yeah, I think you'll do well. Cheers. Cheers, Clayton. I really appreciate it. Delighted to be on there. Thank you for inviting me. And uh, thanks to the XY, XY community for, for everything that you do to make this a delightful profession that makes a difference in society. Awesome, man. Thank you. Thank you.